Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads. I'm Shane. I'm Connor. And I'm Mike. Oh, that was uh, that was very sexy, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, as usual, have a very action-packed, very erratic and uh, <laughs> poorly scripted show for you. So uh, we hope you're going to strap in and enjoy the chaos. So, uh, <laughs> so lads, we, of course, were at Fuzz Talk um, last week. Or is my memory failing me? Was it two weeks or one week? I think it was two it was weeks two ago. Weeks, weeks. Snap. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Foss Talk, that was cool. Really good experience. Um, if you're not sure what Foss Talk is, it is basically like a live version of all the kind of popular uh, Linux podcasts kind of in the UK and Ireland. So um, everyone gets together, does a live show. There's about 50, 60 people there, I reckon. Um, so it's uh, it's just great because you get to meet all the people that you listen to on, on, on the bus and <laughs> you like, it's like, oh, you're actually a real person and that's what you look like. So it's always nice to get to these events. What did, what did you guys think? What were your highlights? It, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, um, a couple of the people I've I kind of met before, so I was I didn't have quite the whole thing of um, Alan Pope. You're actually a person, <laughs> <laughs> and holy holy crap, Alan Pope actually swears in real life. <laughs> uh, it, it that was kind of a novelty for anyone who who listens to the. Um, to the Ubuntu podcast, but no, it's uh, as Shane was saying, it's it's a great opportunity. It's it's kind of people just hanging out in the pub, and whether you're uh, a host, which we're fortunate enough to be, um, uh, or just a fan of one of the podcasts, I uh, highly recommend going along. It's great to hang out with both the hosts of the podcast uh, and the fans. Um, have a couple of beers afterwards and that sort of thing. So it's an annual event that's kind of worth doing if you're in any way near the facility. Uh, we weren't, we flew in, but <laughs> uh, yeah. that's that's the whole part of the term. As as, as uh, people might remember when I said last time, um, people are always amazed that we fly over, but then, you know, it takes people in England about twice as long to get there. <laughs> and I don't think we were the f from the furthest afar. It was uh, Mario Squabek came from Germany, so that's definitely further than Dublin. Um, yeah. And I like the way Connor written off about 10 to 15 pints as a couple of beers, uh, or <laughs> ciders in my case. But it was, as, as you guys were say saying, it was absolutely phenomenal. I haven't laughed uh, in a long time as much as I laughed there. It's always a good fun. It, and uh, yeah, I'm definitely... Uh, definitely flying, uh, flying, flying there for the for the next one, if uh, obviously life and Brexit permit. <laughs> so yeah, it remains to be seen whether we'll be uh, on the stage next year or spectating entirely. But, <laughs> but um, yes, uh, I enjoyed it nonetheless. Um, we got a good response from the crowd, thanks to anyone we met there and anyone who, you know, was there watching us. Um, it was really cool. It was great to get out there and see see you guys in real life. Um, so we have a pretty packed show today. We've got several news items, uh, because there's a lot happening, it seems. Then we're going to have a, a quick discussion about the, uh, noob distros or the beginner friendly distros. So like, a, like celebrity deathmatch back in the day between <laughs> Linux Mint and uh, Zorin <laughs> OS. Um, so yeah. Um, first up though, we have, of course, a coupon code for Azar VPN. Uh, they're a, Swede, sweet, oh my god, they're a Swedish <laughs> VPN provider. Um, you can get 30% off when you pay for three months of Azure VPN with the code Linux Lads. Um, they're a very ethical company. They operate servers in Europe and North America. Their servers are owned and not rented, installed on location by their engineers and running Debian Linux. They provide a WireGuard and open VPN option. Their client is GPL version 2 licensed and is, of course, available on Linux. Um, they take all major payment methods, including crypto. They don't say which cryptos, though, so I'd like to find out. Um, also, you don't even have to give them an email address. Um, use the code LinuxLads when you're ordering and click the green add code button to be sure that, that you uh, apply the discount. That is, of course, available until 1st of January 2020. My God, I get out of breath doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and breathe. I'd make a really shit newsreader. Um, <laughs> so, news items. Um, 
Mike, first one. This is a big one, actually. Quite a big one. Um, quite a lot of Ferrari around this. Um, Facebook and friends announced a new cryptocurrency called Libra, which is a very ambitious cryptocurrency, but it's backed by some big names. It's backed by Facebook, MasterCard, PayPal, Uber, Lyft, Visa, Stripe, Spotify. <laughs> the list goes on. Like, just I could just read all the apps on my phone and it would be, be there. Um, and others say that they are creating a simple global currency and financial infrastructure that empowers billions of people. Um, so this would be nice, and I like the idea, but, you know, obviously it, it, it's coming from Facebook, so alarm bells immediately. Okay, I just want to scream when I see this because, like, capitalism is bad enough when we have states uh, looking over the currency and regulating it. They, these people are trying, or these companies are trying to take it away from the hands of the state, like at least somewhat elected officials, and just uh, basically govern currency by themselves. And they are dressing it up as enabling all the billions of people, some of who, of, many of them who cannot access basic, basic, basic uh, banking facilities. Uh, they are trying to address it up as giving them access, but what this is is a massive power grab. Like I, I would not if if I was running this place, I would not allow this because, uh, like it's it's bad enough that we have cross ownership uh, in f that an advertising company can also own your browser, your operating system, and your search engine, uh, but uh, this is absolutely insane. Like there will if if we keep on giving these companies power there will be nothing they can't do by the way i think i would have to uh, i would have to com uh, i would have to confirm it but i think there's a notable exception in that list and that's google i don't think they are in on it so <laughs> just like that that's that's uh, kind of good uh, well, you're, you're talking about, um, notable exceptions. I mean, there, um, Microsoft doesn't be, appear to be on that list. Apple doesn't appear to be on that list. And, and on if, an infinitum, uh, Amazon, so on and so forth. Um, it, uh, my immediate reaction is the same gut reaction that Chain had, which is, uh, if it's from Facebook, it's naturally, you're thinking, oh, they're going to be hoovering up all my data. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, there does seem to be, um, some, um, like, quote unquote, tr uh, old school trustworthy, uh, financial institutions behind it, like, um, MasterCard, Visa, um, Stripe, um, uh, which aren't old school, but they're kind of, uh, es established, um, PayPal as, as, um, something similar. Um, and you can, it, with Uber and Lyft with the all, um, uh, uh, with, Though, you know, the new millennials not wanting to own cars and they just Uber everything or they just lift, get a lift everywhere. Um, the whole thing of, I, I, I'm, what I'm just thinking about it, um, actually just reading it now, just off the top of my head is one thing that contactless payments and, um, a cashless society, it, this already exists in China with their, 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 uh, their WeChat and their WePay and their Ali, AliPay from Alibaba. Did possibly this is the, the, an attempt to do a, a Western version of this. Um, that just occurred to me when I was just reading the, the article now. Yeah. China has got, as a, as a self-proclaimed communist country and a massively authoritative regime they have got massive regulation i'd imagine uh it it i'm not saying that's good uh, in the way they are doing it but uh the only thing you said like honest and established i think you were mentioning when you were mentioning mastercard and uh, visa the only thing that keeps these companies uh from completely uh, squeezing us dry is regulation. Well, two things, regulation and competition, right? You take away the regulation and they can do whatever they can create. Uh, they can create a monopoly on, on currency. I, I mean, this is an extremely bad idea. There are some guarantees that Facebook, uh, 
says that there will be there, that it will be basically open governorship and that by 2025 they want to make it basically peer-to-peer -peer so that everybody with the technological means can function as kind of one of the confirming authorities in the blockchain. But come on, people, this is Facebook. They don't exactly have great track record at uh, at being honest and well-meaning. I, yeah, I've, I don't... I don't. I would have to be, uh, uh, obviously, with yourself, Mike. That's you have a quite a, a strong opinion on it, and and like you have, like you you foresee a much more negative outcome on this. Um, I mean, I definitely see that as a possibility. Um, I'm sure it would have to be handled very, very well and be under intense scrutiny. But from reading through the white paper and the their website and their information. Um, I can see why they're doing it. I mean, I understand there's an element of power grabbing and, you know, seizing a monopoly. But I don't know. I think that's the way payments and finance is going anyway. So uh, it's just really the motives of those involved. That's the issue for me. But, and I, I don't know. I don't think it's a necessarily evil or, you know, aggressive power grab of any description. Um, I think it will give a few companies a hell of a lot more power, which is definitely not a good thing. But if they stick to this model of open governorship and they stick to this, uh, e these ethical standards they have like put out from right from the start, if they stick to those, it should be, you know, I, I think it could be a very powerful change in society. Like, um, cause I know like cryptos that was always going to be the way forward. It was always the way money was going to go, you know, the, the technology, not the actual, any ex existence, uh, cryptocurrency. You know, I think most of those are not really going to go anywhere in terms of being an actual exchange of value, but something like this could, because it has that backing. So I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's kind of opened Pandora's box on this. So I'm just kind of curious to see where it takes us. Um, yeah, I really don't have anything else like to add to that. For me, I definitely see the um, just speaking very broad terms, not specifically talking about this um, new cryptocurrency. Um, for me, I definitely see uh, the cashless society being the new thing, that we're definitely heading in that direction. I alluded to the example of, of China before. Um, I notice, uh, notice more and more. Um, I myself, um, just in Dublin here, um, very rarely carry cash. And it's just the case of just the, the contactless card and just tapping it and as I'm going along. Um, it's some people, um, even don't you even use the card. They've, they've put the card on their, on their, on their phone or on their smartwatch. And that's what they carry around. I'm not quite, I'm not quite there, but what I do is I use the, the contactless, um, payment on my card. Um, when we were over in, in London, um, I, uh, I used their, their tube system and people say, oh yeah, um, you, what you can do, you can, you can get a, their oyster card and you can top up that up and use that, um, to get yourself in and out of the, of the, of the stations. And, um, so they can charge you from going A to B and whatever. Um, but what I did was I literally just turned up with my, my bank card and just tapped that and th it's, remarkably convenient uh, i ended up missing missing that when i went came back to dublin where we have our leap card which is the the equivalent of their oyster card and i just found myself missing the convenience of just going up with my bank card and just tapping and then um tapping in and then tapping out and then it it would be billing me in the background that was incredibly convenient, and I I found I was thinking, genie, why don't we have this in in Dublin? Um, I found it really useful in London. Yeah, no, um, no one disputes uh, the convenience of cashless society, but it sh I think it should be the EU regulating it. And also, you mentioned uh, foreign currencies. We have oh, well, we have problems enough uh, maintaining a single currency within a scope of countries that are more or less economically on the same level. Imagine you have one global currency that spans from the richest nations to the poorest. How with no governing body apart from a bunch of corporations. Not sure how that's going to work. Otherwise, I grant you that. Yeah, sure. Let's have a cashless society. Let's let's make everything automated, and let's stop giving you know passing around pieces of paper 
it makes a lot of sense, just not by these people. Uh, yeah. We're getting into the whole, um, you alluded to it, but the, it's an entire political rabbit hole by itself, is the whole one world government, new world order, Illuminati, all well, that conspiracy I'm, stuff. I'm all for but, it, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> yeah, my God, there you go. Yeah, we have a we have a uh, I we, think have a so, th- we have a socialist in our midst. <laughs> yeah, I Connor, think, you're I, a socialist. I, I think I think uh, in in uh, that's our cue to move on to the next news topic because we yes, could, like, we I could couldn't go, agree more. We, we, could, we could spend the entire. Uh, this is not a political uh, podcast. <laughs> We're supposed to, but it sometimes just with. goes that way. <laughs> not um, anyway, you're absolutely correct, Connor. Moving swiftly on, you added this one, um, a neat little uh, infographic that shows the uh, the speed differences on several use cases between Linux Mint and Windows 10. So, if you, you know, it was tested on kind of a, a slightly older laptop and they timed some average tasks that, you know, the you know the, the the average person would would perform on a daily basis, like opening Slack, opening a web browser, booting the computer, that sort of thing. Um, and I don't know, I found the results a little bit meh. I, I was actually surprised, uh, like by how, by how it didn't really leave Windows 10 in the dust by any stretch. What do you think? Um, some some of them are are quite significant. I mean, they could have been cherry picking some of the results. I'm just reading down through them, where like, uh, uh, editing graphics would gimp, and they have launching the um. Uh, GNU image manipulation program GIMP in other words um, on Linux Mint it was 9 seconds in uh, Windows 10 it was 43 seconds um, well, but then it was a dent- that was just the, the launch time um, uh, exporting a high resolution JPEG uh, was 6 seconds a piece so that could just be optimizations for the fact that um, uh, GIMP is kind of a uh, it, it, like it has GNU in its name, it is it is targeted towards the the free software world. So it's it's probably tested on on um, a, a, a Linux machine, and then um, so it's probably more optimized to that. So that could be just optimizations. Same mm. thing with um, LibreOffice. They're quoting fourteen seconds for Linux Mint, uh, twenty four seconds with with Windows. Again, LibreOffice, you'd imagine that that is um, targeting towards the open source world. So it's, it's probably, um, optimized towards that. Uh, Firefox is one that I, I can't necessarily say, uh, give that excuse in relation to, um, because, uh, I'd imagine Firefox is quite extensively, um, tested on windows and quite extensively tested on mac mac isn't part of this metric but um, just uh, just mentioning that and in um firefox they're quoting uh 15 seconds for linux mint and 32 seconds for for windows but it, again um some people some people um their their boot up time um of the computer or the opening up time of of a of a of a particular program isn't necessarily um something that is going to affect them that much particularly if they're in a work environment is the kind of thing of uh okay yeah uh, i i boot up the computer in the morning and i go off and make myself a coffee um while the boot, the computer is, is booting regardless of how long it takes whether the computer takes literally 5 seconds to boot they're they're probably it's part of their morning routine they're they're press the power button yeah. in their in their office and they're going off to the the break room where the coffee machine is and they're making themselves a coffee and then by the time they come back, the computer is, is booted. It doesn't matter if it's five seconds or it's two minutes. It, it, yeah. that, that is part of their routine. So some of those things, they, they wouldn't necessarily uh, be a metric that would, would affect them. Um, it would be something that might affect people if they're in their, in their, just in their day to day kind of, um, as a personal computer, particularly like a boot up time would certainly um, affect them. And uh, I think I'm just looking at it here. They're quoting uh, one minute, 17 seconds for Linux Mint, two minutes, uh, 37 for uh, Windows 10. I mean, that is that is a quite a significant margin. I mean, that's that's over a minute longer with Windows. Yeah, um, that's that's to be expected, though. 
I guess because for me, like yeah. Windows is Windows is definitely naturally more bloated, but uh, Linux Mint as Linux distros go is uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't exactly say it's it's a light distro. Um, it would no, it would probably work so, no. work a little better on some older computers. You know, a little bit it would definitely stack up better against Windows on most machines. But yeah, for the most part, I, I think it's at the 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 chubbier end of of the Linux distros. Um. Yeah, we'll move uh slight, move swiftly on. Um, the next one, Mike, uh, you put this in. Uh, so uh, as many of us may have heard, Ubuntu is dropping a uh, 32-bit support with Ubuntu 19.10. Uh, th- this article specifically is to do with like the Wine developers' concern over them dropping 32-bit support. But but yeah, the 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 that in itself is is, is pretty newsworthy. Uh, Mike, what do you well, think about this? I I mean opinions uh, I put this here I put this in the show notes because it's an important piece of news Ubuntu are going to drop the 32 bit archives from 1910 so obviously what's going to happen now is a few companies or few uh, projects like uh, Wine and like Steam will have to deal with that if they have any 32 bit libraries or programs I not exactly completely technically educated on how it works but uh, obviously this has been long coming and uh, it's uh, it's happening we need to tell people and uh, that's pretty much it I think it's a good thing because they've been maintaining it for ages uh, I heard somewhere that the first uh, first uh, 64 bit chip was uh, like for co- in consumer computers, some sixteen, fifteen years ago or something. So yeah, it's 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 completely understandable. It's happening. If uh, pe- there are ways for people to to still use thirty two bit hardware, and I think that's all about it, really. Interesting piece of trivia. Um, we were mentioning the first sixty four bit processor. I think it was the AMD Athlon sixty four. Um, and that's the reason why sometimes you will see uh, 32-bit listed as uh, x86 and you'll see 64 list- listed as AMD 64. I think actually Intel licensed the 32 or the 64-bit um, uh, architecture of AMD. So when, <laughs> so that's an interesting bit of trivia. But uh, I'm not uh, all the usual caveats of uh, I am not a lawyer. Intel, do not sue me if that fact is not correct. <laughs> that is just what I've heard. <laughs> uh, up next, uh, we've got a. We, this was added by uh, you, Connor. Um, the Pinebrook Pro, uh, the upcoming uh, one hundred ninety nine dollar Linux laptop, uh, ARM based laptop, uh, gets keyboard and Bluetooth spec bumps. So, yeah, this is cool. Um, Bluetooth is interesting. Uh, I suppose it makes sense that they would have Bluetooth, but uh, but yeah. Do you want to tell us more about that? So looking through the the specs of of the, um, this, it's um, uh, the keyboard uh, update is the fact that they will be offering um, more than one layout. So I think it's the the uh, they have the more technical name in in the in the article, but I think it's essentially it means the the uh, US layout and the uh, yeah the ISO the, and ANSI the, A-N- yeah ANSI uh, and the uh, the UK layout and the US layout I think is, is what people usually refer to them as, um and the uh, Bluetooth support it probably means that because it's currently in development and and so if new things come along they um they might be able to add it in pretty quickly before the the hardware is finalized i think they've they're moving from um bluetooth 4. Point something um to bluetooth 5.0 um which uh, touts improvements in in um power power management and also i think um the stability of the connection so um uh, and all those kind of iterations are always a good thing yeah, for sure. Um, pretty excited about the Pinebook Pro. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mike, you sound so enthusiastic <laughs> about that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I think we'll uh, segue swiftly on. Um, 
So, uh, Connor, you put in uh, Gnome Shell 3.34's newly improved theme. So, uh, apparently the stock Gnome Shell theme will soon look a little consistent with the new Adwaita, I never know how you say that, GTK theme. Um, I was looking through uh, here. It, again, it's it's something that's that's very uh, iterative. Um, uh, there was a, a, a there was a demonstration, and they said, "Oh, this is what it looked like before, and this is what it looks like now." And I was thinking, "Really? It looks pretty much the same to me." Um, but uh, most of those things uh, you can imagine is is all very uh, iterative. Um, it might be subtle. They might they might have um, like when there might be. A, a drop shadow that's different or something like that. Uh, uh but you, as, as they were clicking around, um, it, but if it, 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 if it's an improvement, if it's, if it's, um, an improvement to the UI, it's, 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 it's always a good thing. Um, it shows that they're working on it. Um, I'm running GNOME Shell on my laptop and I'm, I'm actually, um, quite liking it for that use case. Uh, not on my desktop though. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mike, uh, you put this in. Um, this is uh, an interesting one. Um, Intel drops some exciting clues about the future of clear Linux OS uh, for normal desktop users. So for those who don't know, clear Linux is a, a, a distro released by Intel. Um, I don't fully understand what they use it for. I'm, ass- I- I'm assuming it's uh, like Linux optimization on Intel chips. I can only imagine they're using it for, for that or in their workstations and, and that kind of thing. I think so. This is this comes from Jason Evangelos' article, and uh, he's recently tested Clear Linux and was, uh, if I remember correctly, very happy with it, because on Intel hardware, Intel's Linux uh, runs great, and this is the news that uh, they dropped some clues that they are going to uh, they are going to be focusing on desktop users, you know, gamers and uh, such like, and that uh, maybe in year or two we will be talking about clear linux the same way like we are talking about ubuntu or fedora or uh, pop os so well um uh, when i was reading into the article i um i'm paraphrasing them here but what the the engineers were essentially saying yeah we're we're working on um the optimizations and clear linux in our in our day job but we want to be able to run it when we go home uh, on our on our home computers as well. And what are we doing at home? Like we're 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 gaming, we're consuming content. So we want Clear Linux to be able to do that as well. So they kind of hinted that Clear Linux is going to be not only is going to be aiming towards you know boring air quotes uh, boring kind of workstations and op- optimizations for just it, it will scream on on the hardware it's really fast but, but there's not so so many optimizations for gaming or anything like that um they kind of dropped the hint of you know we're we're human beings we like to have downtime as well we like to have media consumption we like to have games as well well I hope that this means that when when they finally release the fabled uh, Intel uh, dedicated graphics cards, it will have open source drivers straight in the kernel, and it's going to be the most optimized shite out of all most optimized shites. <laughs> uh, I well, they, they, I I think they do have uh, open source graphics drivers for, of course, their their integrated. Um, graphics chips at the moment but the uh, there is a rumor that um a significant rumor and i think it's 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 fairly almost been confirmed that they are working on their own discrete graphics just like um amd and uh, nvidia but um amd do have open source drivers now in the kernel so um uh it would be good to now have uh, both amd and intel with open source drivers that means that um into or nvidia we're here looking at you nvidia get get on that shit yeah for sure it's um it's uh it's always good when the big names get involved in in the next distros um and in the ecosystem in general um i think it's 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 a good thing ultimately because you know it gets more eyeballs on it um so next up uh, i think we're going to move on to our discussion topic um so this is uh 
what we decided to do was uh, we took a, a test ride, uh, compared Zorin OS 15 with uh, Linux Mint 19.1. Why, you ask? Uh, <laughs> because Zorin OS and Linux Mint, for the uninitiated, are uh, what you would call beginner-friendly distros. They're the more polished kind of user-friendly type distros. So uh, with Zorin having a new release, it just makes sense to uh, compare the two, you know, because they're in the same space. Um, Mike, we'll go to you first. What were your thoughts? Well, first, we we kind of decided to uh, to look at it about about at how they are geared towards a special kind of user, a user who is not technical, a user who, uh, you know, because there are many new users who might uh, go straight into the command line and in, install Linux from scratch, but this kind of user that we are uh, that we are looking through the eyes of is. Uh, a person who doesn't necessarily use the computer for the sake of it. He doesn't want to have to fix problems, and uh, he just or she just want a small, uh, a smooth experience, and uh, just you know get the work done. So, uh, I I can start with uh, with my experience with Linux Mint, uh, which I have used. To, haven't used in in years and I came back to it. I thought I'm going to hate it because I remember not liking it a long time ago. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, the installation there's just nothing nothing there. Uh, I think it uses Ubiquity uh, or some kind of an installer like that. Uh, it uh, it installed perfectly. Uh, it welcomed me with a welcome center, so I like that. Uh, I like that because it showed for the you know for the new user. Uh, where things are, it gave if it gave him some kind of a help as well. It uh, referred him to the to to the IRC, which I thought was a bit old school, but it's fine. It uh, showed time shift, which is like the, the snapshotting tool, which kind of confused me because I installed it on ext4, but uh, uh, they said time shift on. Uh, they said they they showed the BTRFS option as well. This and whilst saying that uh, BTRFS was uh, only enabled on BTRFS uh, in, uh, systems, but uh, that was slightly confusing. Uh, I like the I like the uh, chooser for the for the classic versus modern look. Obviously, the modern look is I liked it much more better, much more better, better. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I like the software manager. I loved the chooser for the themes you know when you choose the different colors uh i got a bit confused by the software center which uh, which kind of uh, has got flat pack mixed with debian packages and uh, so you can kind of choose between two uh, which i don't think it's trans it's very clear to a new user what what this kind of mean even as well flat pack is that as a category but i tried installing uh, some proprietary software uh, what is it the, um, you know some uh, the I tried installing uh, a proprietary text editor and it installed fine, uh, which I expected, obviously. Uh, I liked the desktop shortcuts and everything, and everything was going smooth up until the fact, up until the time when it offers updates. I clicked on update. It went, it started updating, it errored out, and this is all in the GUI. It said that I have a broken package and it told me to find it and fix it, but there was no way of finding it because I think the update manager is synaptic but stripped down and it doesn't have all the menus. So I went to the command line. The command line said uh, to do apt dash dash fix dash broken install, but that's the wrong way. It should be, it, that doesn't work. It should be apt install dash dash fix broken. So I could fix it, but I don't think a new user necessarily would. So uh, I think that, uh, and as well, another thing, when you open Firefox for the first time, it says critically out of date, click here to update, and it will start updating. You will It will basically push you to the Mozilla site to download their BZ2 archive, which is not great because that's not how you should update uh, Firefox or Linux. It updates through the package manager. So basically nice beginning but then when it comes to packaging it got confusing it's kind of uh, smelt of the old way linux distribution have been a bit you know you have to do a bit of research to work it yeah uh, connor um you had uh, a bit more experience with zorin os um can you can you uh, provide any counterpoints <laughs> 
Um, well, what, what I'll do, I'll probably do, as I wrote kind of um, my own notes contrasting the two. So um, what I'll do is I'll just read through them, and if if you if you guys uh, have any points that pointers that you want to ask me, then um, feel free to jump in. Um, so on Zorn OS, um, I found it very new user friendly. Um, and they're running their own customized um, GNOME shell rather than forking and making a, a, a desktop environment like Cinnamon. I, I think they're using um, the Arc menu um, in order to have it emulate uh, a, a very Windows-like look. Um, their their terminal isn't in the favorites like on, on most other dish, distros. Um, it needs a small bit of digging like in Windows. Is this a good thing? I kind of asked the question. Um, GNOME software is solid. It also adds flat, uh, flat pack repos by default, which uh, I had no issues with. Um, the default theme is good as in a set and forget way. Um, I much prefer the, the dark theme as the light theme was way too blinding for me. Um, the fact that it can, uh, can change to due to the time of the day is a nice touch. Um, it can be themed as it's just the Ubuntu LTS with a customized in, in GNOME shell at the end of the day uh, as in this is a Unix system, I know this <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, I was able to get the Materia GTK team on it without too much hassle and it didn't seem to break their customized sh- uh, GNOME shell unlike previous versions of Thorn that I have tried uh, it's not the best for Linux awareness as in, I, I wrote down a scenario of, oh, what are you using on your laptop? Uh, Zorn OS. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's kind of like Windows, but it's not. So it, there, it, it, it's, it's kind of in its own branding. It's Zorn OS. It's, it's not telling people that it's Linux necessarily. Yeah, um, that stuck out at me as well. And it seems to be intentional on their part because I was flicking around the website and, um, <clears throat> they don't use the word Linux all that much. And, I think that Solus do a similar thing. Actually, they they don't really, they don't uh, they don't do have any much fa- like bleh, they don't have too much fanfare around the fact that it's a Linux distro, and I think that's intentional. It's just like getting uh, the uninitiated. I've said that word so many times this episode. Um, <laughs> getting the, uh, the 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 unwashed heathens. That <laughs> no, um, getting the non Linuxy people into it just as an alternative. But it's like they don't really care what's under the hood it's just this is different to windows and mac i uh, i'm pretty sure that's because the general uh, knowledge of linux is that linux is hard like even look at the latest video about uh, the thelio systems by uh, linus tech tips, tech tips he mentions and not because he wants to hurt anybody but because he firmly believes this he says like would you then go through learning linux if you bought this you know he, he basically keeps on saying keeps on uh, referring to linux as something hard and is pleasantly surprised that pop os isn't hard uh, and i think that's the that's the reason why they do this uh, they i think zorin actually went even further with this than uh, than for example solus because have you opened open office uh, sorry libre office on zorin it has uh, no, no it has got the ribbon interface by default so it oh, looks a lot okay. like excel and um, you obviously tried the uh, Windows layout. I went straight for the Mac one, and uh, it was that you know it was uh, you can you can see very much that this is GNOME shell you know re, re, redone, but it was a very smooth experience. There I didn't everything updated fine. There was nothing broken in it. Um, to me, it was a bit, you know, un- not not uninteresting, but like nothing extra. But for a person who is a bit scared of computers, I think Zorin would be perfectly okay as an acceptable option. I would, I would certainly agree on the, on that point of view. Um, as I said, uh, kind of mentioned in one of my thing is is it's it's a good um, operating system in a set and forget kind of way. It's it fu- it functions. It's perfectly stable. It's um, you know, the most you you don't might do is you might change the light theme to a dark theme or keep the light theme if that's your preference. There um, there is a very handy uh, color highlight. You can change the the color highlight whether you want blue or pink or whatever. There's that that's very handy, very nice 
to do if that is your preference. Um, if you want to change the background, the, uh, the desktop background is very easy to do as well. And there's some very, very quite beautiful, sensible defaults. If, if that's all you, you want on your computer. And then once that's done, you say, yeah, I've done my background. I've set the theme the way I want it. And now I'm off. I'm, I'm using my computer. Then Zorn OS is absolutely um, brilliant for that. Um, if you're more of a tweaker, uh, then, or if you, if you will say, hmm, what is, what is, I'm curious about this, the, the underlying system behind this. What is Linux actually about? Um, then, uh, it's Zorn OS, it doesn't really help you with that transition. It's kind of, this is the way it is. Uh, which uh, to each to their own use case. I'm not necessarily saying it's a bad thing, but this is the way it is. And if you're not curious beyond that point, then this, this will work perfectly fine for you. Um, and you'll be able to, if you say, Oh, there, there's, uh, there's other things that I can install. I can install GIMP. I can install Inkscape. I can install everything like that. That's all in the software center. But if you're if you're curious and you say, oh, uh, I've heard this about the, the Linux community and I want to install um, KDE or I want to try out other things, then uh, Zorn is not really uh, doesn't really uh, help you with that transition. As in, uh, I th- I think it's 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 aimed at a certain le- part of the market and it does it very well. But for people who who are tinkerers and kind of want to experiment and they want to say oh what is what is uh, XFE like what is KD like and, and those kind of things it doesn't necessarily um, give you an obvious um, path for you to follow to to in order to discover those if you're that curious you'll find them out anyway but Zorn is not necessarily helping you in that direction this this is the thing with um, Linux on the desktop um, it's it's always kind of a case you know, it, it will be revealed to you if you're already interested in that type of thing. I mean, uh, it's naturally curious people. So that like, that's how I got into Linux. I, I didn't find a distro and then find out it was Linux or know it was Linux, but not care about that. I actually sought Linux out, um, like as a, as a hobbyist. So, um, I heard about it. I thought, what the hell is that? And then I, you know, and then the distros, the individual distros came afterwards so I don't really think that's how people find Linux. So, but that said, it's it's good to have these all uh, these distros ready to go. So people, when they find out about this Linux thing, they have an, a, a variety of things like Ubuntu, Zorin, Linux Mint. They have all these kind of shiny, polished, user friendly ones that aren't too scary that they can just immediately grab and say and just do do what they need to do. It's a good gateway drug, basically, is what I'm saying. I don't think that's the way they are thinking about it. This is so this is for people who are not looking for a Linux distro. This is for distro. This is for people who are looking for a functional computer, pretty much not caring what's on it. And uh, they they are doing a good job of it. I th- so this is this in my in my mind, right? This is this there is a massive boundary between people like us who like to tinker with it and who would go to a meetup and who would, uh, you know, uh, make a Linux podcast and uh, do all these things. And people who just buy a computer, maybe they have got a bit of, uh, they want something free and open source, or maybe they just don't like uh, Windows or a Mac. But these, these people would not necessarily care about the underlying operating system or the community around it. They just want something that works, that looks decent, and their their uh, you know their, their interests lies lie, lie elsewhere. So I think this is slightly a side of the Linux community. If by Linux community you mean people who are more active in and more interested in the operating system. Um, just on the on the point of um, I I have. Obviously, have more, more notes. I was I was quite good with this one. Um, oh, you have the contrasting notes with Linux Mint because I was comparing the two. So for Linux Mint, I say I said it was a it's very a uh, uh, user friendly and familiar uh, user experience to Windows Seven slash Ten users. There's a sense that there's a a theme behind it. Um, some really nice tools for, the, for example, the the mirror ranker of repos. I really liked that, where you just, um, 
it, it if you go into the preferences and then you you click around it it ranks it by the um, the the mirrors with the the near, the best ping not necessarily the the uh, mirrors that are closest to you but it's the the quickest mirrors that are closest to you so uh, in my case um one of them I think was was actually a server in the UK even though there's an Irish server it just happens to be a, a better ping or or something like that um I really like uh, cinnamon and uh, as I'm familiar with the, the these Windows 7, 10 way of doing things, in fact, I'm running um, Cinnamon on this computer at the moment. Um, it is has a nice balance of of being familiar with uh, with sensible choices, but doesn't ha- hide the power of of Linux from the user. Uh, I like that there's a, a snapshot tool prompt, um, which. Uh, uh, Mike, you uh, uh, mentioned earlier, and I think that's a, a sensible, secure choice to be prompting in front of, the, of in front of the user. Um, it's very customizable and themable. Um, has had it has had criticism in the past uh, with not showing the kernel updates. Um, having the opinion that it would confuse the non uh, tech savvy user. They now have a prompt at what level of the exposure the user wants. For example, if they want to see the security updates and make their choice or leave it up to uh, the Linux Mint defaults. Uh, I think that Linux Mint would be more of a distro to allow the curious user to grow and become more familiar with Linux to contrast it with Zorn. Yeah, absolutely. I agree on that one. Uh, there is no, there is no reason. There, there is no, there is no reason to disagree with this. Um, I just had a thought that a person who, the the kind of user we are talking about, the kind of that well, there's there could be two different ones. Either somebody is coming from the Windows or Mac world. If they are coming from the Windows world, then apparently Cinnamon would be good for them because, as you said, it's it's pretty much Windows esque in the functioning. But if they are if they've never seen a computer before. I would not put them in front of Cinnamon. I would possibly, as long as they have a phone, a smartphone, I would uh, use the touch option, the, the touch layout of uh, of Zorin, because that's more familiar familiar to people who the only whose only computing experience would be uh, would be a smartphone. You know that kind of uh, full screen menu, the dock at the bottom. And uh, no, no categories in the menu because that's how most smartphones function. Yeah, the um, I was very you, you touched on that, Mike. The, I was very curious about the uh, touch layout that they offer. Um, I found that very interesting, and they showed a mock up on the website of uh, of a of Zorin OS on a tablet. Um, and immediately I was like, oh, because I'm obsessed with Linux tablets. Like I really want one. Um, <laughs> I just like uh, if if we could get something with a nice sharp screen nice build quality just a very nice well-made tablet with a sh- you know a good resolution screen like not something crappy um and if i could get linux on that with a very reliable touch interface my god that would be i'd use the shit out of that like basically i don't i don't know <laughs> <laughs> like but- uh, like but that's thin on the ground right now and i'm yet to see something widely available something kind of uh something obtainable unless you go on aliexpress or something and, and just order some obscure chinese tablet that's probably not terribly good quality so zorin os gives me hope in that regard and i'm kind of sniffing sniffing that mock-up uh, out like uh, like a bloodhound right now <laughs> I mean, I'll probably th- that scenario i probably recommend like uh debian with the uh, uh, like gnome shell on top of it because gnome shell is very touch friendly by default you can make um zorn um uh touch friendly by using some of their options but you kind of have to dig into the settings and uh, zorn is a customized gnome shell so they've actually deliberately changed GNOME Shell to resemble Mac OS, to resemble Windows, to try to make it more familiar to those kind of people. But if if you want just a a, a very good, a very touch friendly um Linux distribution, uh, uh I would run GNOME Shell on on top of, of whatever uh, Ubuntu or uh, Debian or or Arch or whatever you want. I actually came uh, got into problems with Zorin, not because there's nothing anything wrong with it, but because I have a lot of experience with GNOME Shell and customizing the keyboard shortcuts. 
And when you dig into the keyboard shortcuts on uh, Zorin OS, they are kind of confusing because they are the same. They, they refer to the GNOME underlying GNOME shell, but taking into account the the fact that they swapped the activities overview for the window esque menu. So unless you change that, you you are looking at it and thinking why why is this button that I just assigned something doing something else? Because it, they you know it's it's kind of I I think. The GNOME shell is not meant to be tweaked that way, or at least the developers didn't dis- didn't want the or didn't develop for it. So it is it is uh, for a user who already comes in with an opinion, it might be a bit more difficult. But for a new user, definitely. I mean, if I if I were to decide where to put a new user who doesn't like computers, who does not who just wants to get their job done, if I was to decide between a Mint and Zorin, I definitely go for Zorin. Uh, I would I would agree that use that use case um it would it would entirely depend on the user if if somebody who and this is not a criticism of this hypothetical user if it's somebody who does not care about computers they just want their computer to just work and get out of their way and uh, Windows what is Windows I've never heard of it that kind of the, the like the 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 fact that an operating system would would. They would only say, "Oh, what is that? I just want to uh, be able to turn on my computer and click on my web browser and get my work done." If if that is that kind of a person, then oh, when I did out, I'd, I'd recommend Zorin OS to them. If it's a person who's uh, any way curious and it says, "Okay, uh, once the, once it past the first couple of weeks of my computer just working, and or the couple of weeks or a couple of months or whoever it, it takes uh, length of time it takes." Uh, of their computer just working, uh, at the back of their mind, they're they're t- they're thinking, hmm, oh, may, may, I I I don't really like my 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 taskbar down here. I want to move my taskbar somewhere else. Maybe I want to to try messing around with the layout of of things. If I if they're in any way curious like that, they want to change things around. Then I think uh, Linux Mint would would uh, uh, kind of allow their the the their or it would facilitate their transition um, more so than Zorin OS would. Or they should just fucking install Arch and be done with it. We can basically agree that uh, Zorin is a bit like the Mac. It just works, but unlike the Mac, it doesn't explode on your lap, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we shall wrap up the discussion there um, as we're getting on a bit for time. Um so just to wrap up, I um, wanted to go through a couple of events that I think you all should really know about um, for no reason at all. <laughs> uh, Dublin Maker is the first one. So that's going to happen in Marion Square, Dublin, um, July 20th. Um, so Maker uh, Dublin Maker is really good. Like it's, uh, as the name suggests, it's a, it's a bunch of stalls and exhibits and stuff out, out in the park. You know, usually there's nice weather in July. It's a nice day out. There's food trucks, you know, entertainment, all that kind of stuff. It's all to do with, you know, hacking and crafty stuff and, you know, the whole maker culture. Um, us, guy, us guys. Kinda, <laughs> yeah. Kinda, kinda, yeah. We're, we're, I was, you're transitioning yeah. into, we're going, we're going to be yeah. there as well. But I was just going, Pretty much. I was going to e- echo the point of, yeah, it's going to be, you know, your 3D printers. There's going, probably going to be like crafty people making things out of wood and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. They even had a loom there last year. Like, it looks <laughs> like, like, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really nice day out. You know, it's family friendly, all that kind of stuff. So you can bring the kids. Um, but we're going to have a stall there with the Dublin Linux, Linux community. So we might have a few volunteers helping us out, like displays of, uh, some Linux computers that people can, can actually interact with and, uh, we'll have information and all that kind of stuff. So if you're in Dublin or near Dublin, fancy a nice day out in July. If the weather's good, come along, um, and say hello to us. Um, next up, uh, OGCAM tickets are available. So we'd encourage you to get to OGCAM, OGCAMP.org and, uh, you know, pick up a, a ticket to OGCAMP just to guarantee you can get in. Um, we always recommend OGCAMP on this show because it's just brilliant. And <laughs> I have, all, I like that was my first gateway into the whole community. And, you know, where I first got speaking to all of you fine folk indirectly or directly. 
Uh, all cap. Uh, it was last year was my very first year, and I have already bought my ticket and my flights and accommodation. So, uh, other than freaking something. Uh, series happening like I'm not able to get the time off work or a uh, bus hitting me or something like that <laughs> then I should be sh- should be able to make a lot to all uh, camp if my if a flight sick and accommodation booked um but uh it's one of those things that I was eager eagerly anticipating um when they would announce the venue and they have announced the venue uh uh the it, it's details are on their website and uh, details escape me at the moment but it's yeah. it is in it is in this very central Manchester location um I think it's in a hotel, and because it's in a hotel, I believe that that hotel has already uh, booked up. But there would be uh, nearby hotels. There's there's one that's right beside it uh, that you might be able to get that one, and there's plenty within a ten fifteen minute walk radius of of that location. Yeah, I should be there too, unless I'm in prison for hitting corner with a bus. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, as always, guys, um, you can support us by going to Linux, linuxlads.com forward slash support. Um, if you enjoy the show, uh, obviously it costs us a little bit of money to make. Not much, but, you know, if you want to throw us enough money for a coffee or a drink or whatever, we would absolutely welcome that. Um, you can catch up with us on uh, tel- the Telegram group. Come in and chat to us directly. You can shout us out on Twitter. Get in touch through Facebook and Mastodon. All the links to those will be in the show notes. Um, I've got sick of reading out the URLs, so that's why I'm not, <laughs> that's why I'm not doing that. Um, you can email us on show at linuxlads.com as well. Um, anything at all you'd like us to read out or any cool things you discovered recently, let us know. Um, um criticism, positive or negative, uh, certainly, uh, uh, we're, we're learning all the time. So if there's, if, even if you want to write, write us an angry email and say, <laughs> That that thing that you mentioned, that's a complete and utter wrong, is completely and utterly inaccurate. Yeah. Or if you want to complain about our audio or something like that, we're we're you always wanna, we're always open to co- to you criticism. Want to, if you want to interject or say, well, actually, we love that. <laughs> yeah, um, no. If you, if you if you want to interject, then uh, send your uh, send your interjections to Dev Nolo, where they will be uh, expected. <laughs> so anyway, um, that was that was a great show. Uh, interesting discussion i know we ramble on a lot but sure whatever um until next time guys uh, i've been shane i've been connor and i've been mike goodbye bye bye